Hello, everyone. Welcome to our conversation today. We're going to be talking about how to focus on proficiency and planning with the can-do statements. My name is Jessica Haxey, and I am the supervisor of World Languages for New Haven Public Schools in Connecticut, and I'm ACTFL president-elect. Hi, I'm Paul Sandrock. I'm ACTFL director of education. And Jessica, I'm really looking forward to our, our chat today. So am I, Paul. Great to be with you. So I have a really big question that I hear a lot from teachers, and I think it's an important place to start. Really, what should our goals be? But I think it's important to refocus that and say, what are your learners' goals for learning another language? Does that sound like your students? Absolutely, Paul. When I was teaching Japanese, I would say that my learners' goals were to be able to travel to Japan uh, or possibly uh, understand anime, comics, or be able to order at the Japanese restaurant in town. And in New Haven, uh, where we have six languages, I know a lot of them have as their goal to be able to use it out in the community, down at the taco trucks, or perhaps to welcome one of our new arrival immigrants to, to the school. How about you, Paul? You know, it makes me think about how students always want to use language, not just study about language. That's what proficiency is. It's real world use of language. And I think that's what all students want. And as I look at these photos, I see students using language in real situations, whether they are interacting to make a purchase in their own community, whether they are abroad at a restaurant, whether they are having a conversation with a virtual partner, maybe playing a video game with a kid halfway across the world, or whether they're thinking ahead to their future careers and their, their world of work. And as I look at all of these images, you know, just I don't see that these students are focused on being perfect. They're focused on getting something accomplished, a very communicative purpose. You know, they're thinking about the messages that they are creating, that they are exchanging, that they're understanding. It sounds like the three modes of communication. Do you think proficiency can look like that in the classroom? Well, I definitely think that we can give students experiences in all three modes of communication. Like we see in these photos, students are doing things like using the interpersonal mode to engage in in-person conversations or nowadays more often uh, online conference conversations. We see students interacting with written or spoken or video texts over, over laptops possibly or in person. Uh, and, we, and we see students using presentational mode to communicate something that they won't, don't want to say to an audience, which in this case might be their teachers or their peers, or hopefully it might even be someone across the world. I think the key to quality in all of these activities is that the teachers have chosen engaging context for these learners and that they've been purposefully planned backwards from an understanding of the proficiency target for the year or the unit or even just the task itself so that both the learner and the teacher can see the, the proficiency target, the goal for the task, and they can see their progress toward that target. And Paul, one thing I love about these pictures is that they feature the idea of teacher as a coach or facilitator, sort of standing to the side and not necessarily always at the front of the room. I couldn't agree more. You know, I'm going to pick up on your idea of a coach because I'm often challenged, how am I going to describe proficiency to my learners? I think it is exactly that idea of a coach they totally understand. I'm looking at these illustrations and these photos and seeing, wow, yes, a learner starts out with someone giving them some advice, some feedback, checking their learning and their progress, but not doing it for them, not making it so fail safe that they never make a mistake because we learn from our mistakes and improve. I see a young pianist being coached and eventually Don Shirley is an amazing jazz pianist. I see a little boy learning to swim and there are some supports there in place. Eventually he won't need those because he's Michael Phelps. And I see a young lady who wants to be an artist learning about Frida Kahlo and trying to imitate Frida Kahlo and eventually she might be her, an artist in her own right, just as Frida Kahlo. There's definitely a role for the teacher, but the goal is that the students can do this independently. That's proficiency. 
That's the growth journey. Can-do statements provide such a perfect map or blueprint to get me to that proficiency goal, to help my learners realize what is the path towards that proficiency. And I see on this journey, hill after hill after hill, they want to climb higher and higher and higher and get further and further away from me, the teacher, and more and more off on their own journey towards that proficiency goal that they have in mind. So my job as the teacher, as the coach, is to help them understand, are you making progress towards that goal? So I might have some ongoing checks for learning that simply say, did you accomplish this lesson's objective? Do you have those words? Can you use those structures? Can you ask questions? Can you describe things? Okay, you've got some good tools. Can you actually use them in a communicative task, which would form a good formative assessment? Can you put these things together and show me that you, you understand how to use them, not in isolation, but now in a more meaningful context? And finally, at the end of each unit and unit after unit, I'm giving you a summative assessment that really shows you can independently perform these tasks getting closer and closer to that proficiency goal. And I think it's the important thing to remember that this just doesn't happen once and I check it off and say, oh, you've reached that level. You did it in the comfort of this context. Let's do it again in another context and see if you can still do as well. I think those can-do statements really help us get more and more specific as we try to describe proficiency for ourselves and for our students. They help us define, develop, and measure proficiency. And the important part of this blueprint is that it's not just moving from novice to intermediate to advanced. It is also, can I do that in a purposeful way in each of the modes of communication? Can I take in a message and show that I understand it? Can I exchange a message and show that I can negotiate the meaning that may be necessary? And can I create a message and send it out to an audience that I have in mind? And this brings us into a new section that was added with the revised version of the can-do statements, and that's the intercultural can-do statements. And these can further guide our planning by showing us how proficiency is developed within the strong context of investigating and interacting within a cultural frame. And thereby, we're developing intercultural communication skills as well as proficiency as we move through the, the proficiency levels. So look at these verbs. Um, there's, these are some terrific verbs we can look at as we move across. We've got investigate and interact, two things that students definitely want to be doing, especially with cultural contexts. And at the novice level, they might be just identifying the products and practices they see. So if we look at this picture as an, an example, um, they might be able to identify some of the things they see in the picture. But by the intermediate level, they're able to make comparisons between the products and practices that they that perhaps they see going on in this picture and compare that to things that might happen in their own community or even other communities around the world. And then by the advanced level, they are explaining some of the diversity among the products and practices and beginning to see how it relates to perspectives. If we look at interact, this is this is even more important. The students are learning how to function within that culture, so they're developing intercultural skills. And at the survival level, even as a novice, they might be able to say, tomato, tomato please, or yes, please, thank you, here you go for the money. But by intermediate, they're able to function, they're able to perhaps negotiate the price a little bit. And by advanced, they're able to interact at a competent level and even deal with an unfamiliar situation. Maybe they don't have enough money to pay or maybe they have to bring some, something back because it isn't uh, fresh enough or what they wanted. So this to me really drives home uh, and gives us good examples, good solid examples of how proficiency develops across the levels but within a strong context. And it also helps us understand how we can be developing intercultural skills. Well, let's move from that standard of interpersonal communication, where I see these, those key verbs about interact and negotiate meaning, share information, share reactions, feelings, and opinions. And let's link it to the can-do statements because that is what is very explicitly done with these three key questions. Interact and negotiate meaning, how can I meet my needs or address a situation? 
like maybe arranging a place to meet to accomplish something later today. Sharing information. How can I exchange information and ideas in conversations? Like maybe we are exchanging information that we found out from different media um, to try to follow what's the truth on this news story today. Or maybe we're sharing reactions, feelings, and opinions, like exchanging our reasons for being for or against having school all online this fall. And those same questions, as we look at them and see how important they are across moving from novice low all the way to advanced and beyond, they all have a similar structure. Let's zero in on one of those. Let's look at this intermediate low. What does, how well do intermediate low learners express, react to, and support opinions? Well, the formula that you see in each one of those squares always starts with I can, meaning not the teacher got me to do it, the teacher asked the right question, but I can do that pretty much without him or her, right? The function I can express, ask about, and react with some details at this intermediate low level to preferences, feelings, or opinions, followed by a context. Well, I can do it on familiar topics. I can do it well in this unit. I might not be so ready at the beginning of the next unit, but I will try to get to this same level by the end of that next unit. And then the how well part. What kind of language am I using? Well, I'm able to express those opinions on this familiar topic by creating some simple sentences, but also by asking not just any question, but appropriate follow-up questions. So let's dig a little deeper and see, well, if that was intermediate low, I wonder what comes before on this roadmap to get to higher levels of proficiency, and where would I go after that? Let's build up just those functions around preferences. Look at the novice low, expressing basic preferences. I like. Reacting to others' preferences. Oh, not just I like, but uh, me too. Wow, that's really amazing. They might just be memorized expressions, but I'm reacting. Look at the novice high, express, ask about, and react. Oh, I have to ask questions about these too. And we already saw the intermediate low, we're adding in more details. Deeper into the intermediate, it says exchange opinions and provide basic advice. Look at the intermediate high, explaining my preferences and providing advice. And finally, at that advanced level, maintaining the conversation, keeping it going with these extended explanations and comparisons. Wow, that's a long journey towards higher levels of proficiency but I can always see where I'm going next. When I think about the importance that was placed on that idea of asking questions, let's see where that starts at the novice low level. Oh, nothing. They don't ask questions. That's right. So if I don't get my students to ask questions, if I'm the only one ever asking questions, that's where they stay. I don't want that. So I want to get them to novice mid pretty fast so that where they can at least ask a few simple questions and even move them into the novice high range by adding some original questions. Now they're really starting to use the language they are acquiring to express their own personal thoughts. Less predictable, less memorized and practiced. Moving into the intermediate, it's that whole idea of follow-up, keeping the conversation going, adding more variety, and at the advanced level, maintaining, adding in more probing questions and even debating with very precise questions. What I love about this chart, just pulled right out of those can-do statements, is that it gives every person a beginning point and a next level to aspire toward. So even if I am a non-native speaker and I'm starting in the novice range, a heritage speaker may be in that intermediate range, uh, a native speaker who may have deep conversations at home or may only talk around the dinner table and have some more intermediate level questions. Well, does that mean that an intermediate range speaker, every single comment they hear, they have to ask a follow-up question to it in order to constantly be proving that they're at the intermediate level? You know, that would be kind of a weird conversation. You <laughs> kind of feel like you're being interrogated rather than having a nice comfortable chat like we are right now. Right. What's important is that the can-do statements are well-named it's what I can do 
not what I always must do. I think that sounds like a tweetable quote right there, Mr. Sandrock. <laughs> Just because you can do doesn't mean you always must do. You know, Jessica, that even becomes more important when we look at the text type. Because a lot of times people just insist on, let's give a sentence every single time. Because as we build that up, notice that the novice lows and mids are pretty much just in words, phrases, kind of practiced and predictable. Notice that novice high, it says simple sentences, which makes me think, oh, they're intermediate, they're green, but it's only most of the time. And can they really do that? It's the idea that they are creating with sentences. They're trying to express their own thoughts, not just what has been more rehearsed, more predictable from the class um, activities and tasks that moves them into the intermediate realm. And again, not every single time are they gonna come out with a sentence. It means they can do it. And as you move forward, it's also really important to look at that idea of paragraphs. Just because you can give a paragraph doesn't mean you're at the advanced level. Is it truly a paragraph that links the ideas together, not just a few um, thoughts, a few uses of because, when, therefore? That's getting there, but not quite an advanced level paragraph yet. And people also focus a lot on the idea of time frames and think, oh, well, past tense. If my students can use past tense, they must be at the advanced level. As in all of these, I think an important message is it all starts at the novice low level. Well, if the novice low is practiced or memorized words and phrases, their past tense to talk about last weekend is simply five verbs that are in the past tense. I went, I ate, I saw, I practiced, I enjoyed. There, I'm ready. Give me those verbs and I'm talking in the past tense. Oh, I have to start there in order to finally get to that control way up at the advanced level. Thank you for that, Paul. I'm gonna bring us back to those original pictures that we began with, with the pictures of the classroom versus the real world. So when we have students uh, performing in our classes, doing daily learning checks or summative or formative assessments, those are what we're thinking of as performances. Those are really just snapshots of how they are doing in the content and skills that they've learned in our classes. And usually it's those things that we've just finished teaching them. What we need to do in order to build that bridge from performance to the proficiency required in the real world is to ensure that we are always recycling and reinforcing the skills that they've already learned and that we're giving them a range of performance practice across topics and situations throughout the year. So like you said, you might do quite well uh, in a performance at the end of a particular unit and think that you're out of, you hit your proficiency target, but as soon as you start the new topic and situation and theme in your new unit, you go back down because you need to relearn those skills to pull yourself back up to that proficiency. So we can build those skills by with those range of performances throughout the year and by pushing students with our questioning and with our tasks and with our planning up to that next level of proficiency. So what we're saying is that we want our students to have sufficient varied practice in our classes so that when they get into the real world and all of that nervousness and uh, unpredictability of the real world kicks in, they already have the ability to stay calm, draw on the strategies and the skills that they've learned in our classes and, and function and, and find their way in the real world, if you will, with the skills that we have given them. And so when we're planning with the, with the can-do statements and keeping proficiency targets in mind, these are a couple of questions that I always ask myself. What does this unit or lesson or activity do to build my learner's proficiency? And, and if I can't answer that question well, then I might not choose to do that activity or choose to structure the unit or task that way. And also, what information does this activity or unit or task give me and the learner about their progress toward proficiency? And I found those to be very helpful in focusing me in on in what I'm doing my planning. You know, Jessica, I had an experience recently working with elementary teachers of Indonesian in Jakarta. And this was exactly where we ended up working together. 
that they were really conscious of maintaining their progress towards their proficiency target, and yet suddenly they found themselves teaching remotely with like once a week, 15 minutes, they could see their students synchronously. And they said, we only got to see them about three days a week anyway, and now we're trying to take these novice loads and still get them towards novice mid. How can we do that? Well, we went right back to those can-do statements and they solved our planning dilemma. When we looked at the novice low presentational can-do statement, they focused on what is it asking them to do? Name familiar people, places, and objects. When they looked at the novice low interpersonal, what was it asking them to do? Express basic preferences or feelings. And notice in both cases, the how well part of the formula in that can-do statement was well, they're going to use their practice or memorize words and phrases, okay, what they already know, with the help of gestures or visuals. So I want to make sure that we include gestures or visuals to help them perform. They wanted to go back to what is our summative assessment that these students are going to be performing about six weeks from now? Well, they said now it's going to be in groups of four in a Zoom meeting. That's all that they're going to be able to do. So the teacher will be there to kind of coach and guide them through it. But they said it's the same assessment. Moving quickly into remote learning has not been easy. How are you feeling? That was the context that had changed, but the rest was the same. Tell each other what you like to do in your neighborhood when you feel different emotions. And share as much as you can, describing what you see and feel so your friends can picture your neighborhood and can even add a comment. With that summative task in mind, they said, well, okay, this week, we're going to take that presentational low can-do statement and say, we're going to practice naming people in different businesses in the community and naming things they see when they walk through the neighborhood. How could they practice the interpersonal online, expressing basic preferences or feelings? Well, they can express likes and dislikes about their community or express where they go when they feel certain emotions. Okay. I have a sense of what I want to do, but what is it going to look like when we do this online? Well, they designed tasks. Again, as the can-do statement said, please support them with visuals or gestures. They couldn't do the gestures, so they were heavy on the visuals. Again, trying to name things they see when they walk through the neighborhood, they said, well, you have to kind of remind yourself the vocabulary that you have. So what do you see? Write it down. List the colors that you see. Write those down. List what you see in the streets. List the locations. List anything that's in nature. All right, these students have now created their own word bank. It didn't have to be given to them. We were just activating what they already knew. And now the task was use any of these words to describe your neighborhood. After that, they said, well, then maybe two days later, another task when I give them feedback on the first one, could be I can name things I see when I walk through my neighborhood, like the different types of buildings, shops, or things to do. Okay, they've named them. What are they going to do that's going to help move them closer towards that conversation they eventually have to have? Well, tell three things you do in your neighborhood. Let's give them a sentence starter. In my neighborhood, I like to. Okay, that's going to be helpful. Then let's move on to remembering some of those feeling words that we've been using throughout the year. Can I express where I go when I'm feeling different ways? So this was a review activity they did later in that week. They wanted to keep the learning going and get closer to that summative assessment. And they said, well, I can express where I go when I am is what they are working towards. Well, let's just review transportation with these illustrations. I go to school by, I go to shops by walking, by bike. I go to restaurants by, they know their neighborhood, they can answer that. And then they said, well, you know, we practice all of these things, we've reviewed a lot, but can they really do anything with it? Let's move away from those ongoing checks for learning and move towards a formative assessment. What can they do with what they've learned? Can I really express where I go when I am? These are only novice low. So let's give them a frame, a sentence frame to fill out for five different feelings, tell your story and draw an illustration. When I'm feeling maybe happy, I like to go to a park by bicycle. And they kept asking themselves with every task, 
with every formative assessment, what did I learn that's getting them closer towards my proficiency target and what comes next? And what eventually came next was that summative assessment as these young students were able online to have that conversation. The students and the teachers all realized they had met their can-do statement targets. Uh, let's end with this student and let's take a moment to pause and imagine that he has just left our programs after spending either a year with us or maybe 12 years with us or maybe maybe 16 years with us in our language programs. Whenever he does walk out that door, we want to be confident that we have given him the proficiency skills and the intercultural communication skills to be able to walk out into the world and use the language in the way that he wants to use it, whether that be for work or for travel or for fun. And we want him to be confident that he can do the language out in the real world. And I really think that the can do statements serve as that guide map, both, both for us and for him to be able to reach those goals. Thanks so much for this conversation, Paul. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. And we've been able to give you just a brief introduction today. We hope it inspires you to open up this map this guidebook that is the Can Do Statements, and we hope you access all of ACTL's resources to be able to better define, develop, and measure your students on the journey to proficiency. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>